Welcome everybody to the September meeting of the Mornington Peninsula Astronomical Society and uh, this week and uh, indeed this month the uh, most exciting thing I mentioned uh, in the astronomy world was uh, the detection of uh, a possible biomarker uh, showing uh, uh, potentially life on uh, the planet Venus or rather in the uh, clouds of Venus unlike in uh, certain early B-grade uh, movies from the 1950s and 60s, uh, depicting uh, Venus with uh, very different uh, inhabitants, as shown on the, uh, the front slide of um, uh, today's uh, pack, uh, it would be uh, somewhat more uh, rudimentary uh, life than, uh, than that. Now, this evening, um, I uh, first of all wish to start by welcoming any new members of the society and indeed uh, even in these lockdown times we uh, do still have members uh, joining and uh, we look forward uh, certainly in the relatively near future to uh, hopefully meeting you all in person at some stage uh, down at uh, our observatory at the Briars Historic Park in uh, Mount uh, Martha. Uh, the park itself is still uh, out of action uh, for access by uh, any vehicles, though that's being reviewed by Council uh, next uh, Monday, so uh, watch this uh, space. I'll then uh, quickly go through uh, the events of uh, the past month and also the upcoming month. Um, there haven't been a lot, given that um, we have all been in lockdown. Then I'll show uh, a very interesting um, European video um, about uh, life and uh, love in space. Uh, if we uh, take the Venus, and uh, Venus of course being the Roman goddess of uh, love, take that theme uh, to uh, uh, some pretty left field uh, areas. Uh, this is uh, given by um, a, an astronaut, a European astronaut who has actually flown up on the space station and uh, they go into, he goes into um, quite a bit of details of how they actually live up there in practice. Uh, given that it's an international crew, so some are Russian, some are European, some are American, and uh, some are, uh, are other uh, nationalities. Following that, we'll have uh, Sky for the month, given by uh, Mark uh, Stevens for uh, September, and he usually does uh, a fantastic job uh, putting together his uh, PowerPoint uh, slides based on the, uh, the Quasar Almanac. Uh, the 2021 Quasar Almanac should become uh, available to the Society later next month, that's uh, October. Uh, but uh, further details about that will be um, put out on the Society's email uh, group, uh, eScorpius, and also uh, on uh, the members' Facebook page um, sometime between now and then. The Almanacs have actually already gone to the printers, that is uh, confirmed, so it's just now waiting um, uh, printing and uh, delivery uh, of them. Following that, um, I'll show a short video uh, about uh, the detection of uh, the phosphine gas on uh, Venus, which has led to speculation of um, uh, there being potential for life. And this particular video comes from Cardiff University and the Royal Astronomical Society and is given by Pro Professor Jane Greaves, who uh, is actually the lead investigator of uh, the paper that was uh, published this week in uh, Nature Astronomy, the, a very, very prestigious um, international peer-reviewed uh, journal. So they, uh, they certainly uh, rigorously uh, review uh, any claims uh, uh, that are potentially as grandiose as uh, this one. Following that, I'll um, show a little bit of uh, Dr. Diane Cowan, Diana Cowan, uh, physics girl. Uh, talking about the uh, surprising ways um, that uh, life on the planet Mars rather than Venus uh, is actually uh, quite hostile and something to think about if you're hoping uh, to get a one-way ticket to Mars at some stage uh, in the future. Um, there are quite um, some real challenges there uh, when you get to Mars and not necessarily the ones that uh, you might first uh, think about. Following that, uh, I'll show a, a short article, uh, sorry, a short uh, video about anthropomorphic say that again, anthropomorphism, which is uh, uh, attributing uh, human emotions to, uh, to animals and, uh, of course, inanimate to objects as well, such as, uh, for example, um, branding the planet Venus as uh, the planet of love or Mars as being the, uh, the planet of war. After that, uh, there will be a video on uh, Einstein's love letters uh, given by uh, Australian, in fact, Queenslander Toby uh, Hendy and um, she's uh, done some research uh, into uh, um, some of those and uh, presents uh, those that are publicly uh, available. 
and uh, last video will be on um, uh, why life seems to speed up as we get older and uh, almost all of you um, uh, would have uh, experienced that uh, in some uh, form uh, over your lifespan and uh, more likely to become noticeable the older you get and that's given by uh, Dr Derek Muller also a former um, Victorian who uh, now lives uh, overseas and uh, runs a Veritasium uh, channel on uh, YouTube. Failing that, the meeting will close with uh, Paula Miles giving an a cappella version of uh, the Toto classic uh, called uh, Africa. Now the announcement of um, potential life on uh, Venus is actually uh, quite exciting given the surface of the planet is uh, around about 426 degrees Celsius. So. Um, extremely uh, hardy life form uh, if it were to be on the surface. Uh, however, the announcement um, uh, this week about uh, the detection of possible biomarkers on Venus was uh, actually in the clouds. So in other words, it was looking at uh, the edge of the, uh, the planet so they could see how far above uh, the surface um, uh, the molecules of phosphine that they detected uh, were located. And that was about uh, between 53 and 63 kilometres uh, high above the ground. Now, up at that temperature, uh, sorry, up at that altitude, the temperature is only about 20 to 30 degrees Celsius. So, um, quite uh, successful um, for life as we know it at uh, that particular uh, altitude. But of course, um, Venus's atmosphere has an awful lot of sulfuric acid, which is a very strong acid that most people will be familiar with um, as the acid inside your car's uh, lead acid uh, battery. Uh, and that can do quite a bit uh, of uh, damage to uh, living tissue. Uh, and also it's not really uh, uh, known why, why um, phosphine is being produced other than uh, potentially from decaying life forms, because that's the only naturally occurring source of phosphine that uh, is known on the earth. It may very well be that um, there are other geochemical or possibly um, photosynthetic pathways occurring uh, in the higher altitudes of uh, Venus that just haven't been uh, known about. Uh, and this might be pointing to that rather than it being uh, as a, a byproduct of life. So phosphine itself is an unusual uh, molecule. It's uh, very reactive. Um, it's, uh, it's shaped like a, a trigonal pyramid, so a pyramid with, a, a tri with triangular sides all around. And it has a pair of um, unbonded uh, electrons on it, which uh, makes it uh, uh, quite reactive. Now, it usually uh, on Earth um, smells like uh, you might get uh, at a garbage dump or a, uh, or a sewage treatment plant. Um, some people liken it to uh, the smell of uh, dead and uh, rotting fish. Uh, but of course to actually get that smell it, you have to have it uh, in the open so uh, you wouldn't um, be able to uh, smell it that way if we could magically transport you to uh, to Venus to uh, have a bit of a sniff. Um, so phosphine itself um, lasts very very uh, little time uh, once it's uh, been formed um, and what that tells you immediately is that if it's being detected in significant quantities then there must be some mechanism that's constantly replenishing it because uh, natural processes uh, of uh, breaking it down or causing it to react with other substances um, are constantly taking uh, the phosphine out of the atmosphere of uh, Venus. Now the current study actually looked at um, observations of data that were taken in 2017 and uh, 2019 from um, Hawaii up at Mauna Kea I think and also from um, one of the observatories high up in uh, Chile itself. So uh, a little while ago the observations were taken but uh, nevertheless these things, uh, particularly when you make an announcement of this nature, uh, you have to rule out uh, as best you can any other uh, mechanisms, uh, particularly if you're claiming life um, as being uh, detected. So this was an international collaboration and uh, the, the lead um, uh, collaborator who uh, presents uh, a short video a little bit later uh, today uh, is from uh, Cardiff University in uh, Wales in the UK. Um, interesting also that uh, Carl Sagan back in 1967 um, had suggested the possibility of life being detected up in the upper atmosphere of Venus rather than uh, at the surface. So I think it came as um, quite a surprise uh, even to the researchers themselves when um, 
they were able to actually detect something there. Now, whether or not it's an indicator of um, life, of course, is another matter, but it's a, it's a possibility. And indeed, this sort of technique is one that's being used even for attempting to detect um, uh, life uh, on planets around other star systems, so the exoplanets themselves. Uh, so even if you find one that's in the Goldilocks zone of its star and is about uh, the same size as Earth and um, even has uh, water present, how do you know if there's actually life uh, present on that planet? Well, you look for any other unambiguous uh, substances that that life uh, gives off that are not known to come from any other form. And indeed, phosphine is uh, one of the ones that are being looking for, looked for. Uh, I believe methane and, uh, and others as well have been uh, suggested as possible uh, biomarkers. They in themselves don't necessarily mean that life is there, it's uh, more a case of um, that it may be there. And in terms of uh, current missions uh, to Venus, uh, we were all familiar with uh, back in the 1970s how um, the American uh, Mariner craft uh, went there and then of course the, uh, the Russian Venera probes, uh, some of which successfully landed on the surface of Venus and survived only for a very short while before being uh, destroyed by the conditions on the surface. It would be quite fascinating that they've actually potentially plummeted through a, a layer of life and then down to an area where there was absolutely uh, no life uh, pre present on the surface of Venus. Now at the moment the Japanese have um, their Akatsuki uh, craft that's uh, mapping Venus and uh, particularly I think at the moment it's looking at the dark uh, streaks and dark markings of Venus uh, itself and um, there will be undoubtedly renewed interest in uh, looking at the uh, results of that to see uh, what kind of uh, gases or other substances uh, it's able to uh, detect. NASA's uh, administrator this week also announced that um, they're looking at uh, another mission to uh, Venus. So in other words, uh, it has distracted attention a little bit from uh, Mars, and this is the uh, Veritas uh, mission that is currently scheduled for 2026. Um, it's uh, not um, not really uh, uh, well well and truly underway as yet. Uh, it requires uh, budgetary uh, uh, approval to uh, go ahead, but uh, I suspect with this announcement of possible life that that uh, is going to be more of a uh, rubber stamping. So watch this space. Right, well, uh, recent events over the uh, past month, we've had absolutely no public uh, scout guide or any school events uh, whatsoever due to the lockdown, and uh, we're not like to see those until uh, January next year uh, at the earliest, uh, just purely um, because of the uh, infection risk uh, um, from people sharing telescope eyepieces at uh, very close uh, contact. Um, during August uh, we had a, a committee meeting on the 26th and uh, the Society decided to uh, sign up for a, a proper Zoom account which we now have which uh, opens up the possibility of its uh, use uh, by members uh, particularly for social gatherings and, and the like and uh, for the Society as well for uh, other uh, types of uh, online meetings. We've also been approached by the State Library of Victoria asking for all past copies of um, the Society uh, newsletter journal called uh, Scorpius going right back uh, to the distant past. Um, I'm in the process of uh, trying to find out at the moment what their minimum requirements are. For example, the National Library of Australia requires at least 300 dot per inch if uh, you're scanning them um, for material that, uh, that they take in. Uh, so we'll uh, respond to them uh, in due course and of course that will mean that all editions of uh, Scorpius um, past, present and future uh, will actually one day also be online um, at uh, the National Library and also at uh, the uh, State Library of Victoria as they do share their uh, electronic uh, records. And lastly, uh, Life member Ian Sullivan has been going back through some of his old uh, training notes and is trying to uh, come up with uh, training that uh, can potentially be uh, rolled out to uh, future members in um, basic uh, astronomy topics. Uh, these are the ones that uh, certainly newcomers uh, may be unfamiliar with, um, but uh, even more seasoned members can uh, certainly benefit from a, a brush up on, on things uh, such as you know, what is right ascension, what is declination and, uh, and the likes of uh, that. On the 5th of September we actually used the Zoom account and had our very first online social gathering and that was a great success with about a dozen or so uh, members turning up um, during the evening on the Saturday evening um, at various times 
staying for a little while and then uh, going, depending on uh, what their circumstances are. And these will be held uh, certainly during lockdown um, on the first uh, Saturday evening of uh, every month uh, going forward. So the next being the first Saturday evening, eight o'clock um, of uh, October, which is still a little way uh, away. All members, of course, are welcome to uh, join in. Um, there's no formal structure to the meeting in the sense that there's no um, talk planned uh, and uh, we can talk about uh, whatever we like and uh, answer any questions that any members may have, whether they're new members asking about the society or older members um, sharing hints and uh, tips about uh, what they do at, uh, at home with astronomy and what uh, maybe their photographic uh, hints are as well. So access to the Briars at this stage remains blocked at least until the 28th of uh, September uh, due to the uh, pandemic restrictions, unless uh, something uh, radical uh, occurs uh, in the next... Uh... So next, uh, next month, before we meet uh, in October, uh, the next uh, committee meeting is due on the 23rd of uh, September, which is a Wednesday evening at 8 o'clock. Any financial member of the society is uh, welcome to uh, dial in and uh, listen to uh, the uh, proceedings of uh, the committee of the Mornington Peninsula Astronomical Society and uh, details for getting into that uh, Zoom meeting will be sent out on the eScorpius um, email group for members uh, prior to that uh, time. Uh, our next uh, social gathering on the Saturday will be uh, 3rd of October and again all members are welcome to uh, dial in uh, to that uh, for an informal get together. It's a sort of a barbecue without a barbecue being there. And uh, the next uh, meeting scheduled for the 21st of October um, is going to be uh, pre-recorded and will be on YouTube uh, pretty much as this uh, will be uh, later to uh, today for uh, the, sep uh, the September meeting. Uh, at this stage, the November meeting uh, from um, our Phillip Island uh, guide um, at uh, Point Leo for a geological expedition for members and their families that are interested uh, on the 21st of Oct Oct sorry, on the 21st of November is still uh, going ahead, but I would say with a question mark depending very much on what the uh, restriction easings are over the uh, the coming weeks. And uh, December at this stage, we normally have a free Christmas barbecue at uh, the uh, lead up to Christmas each year of the Society at the Briars. And that will very, very much depend on uh, what the access levels are at that time to the Briars, um, whether or not uh, we are able to get gatherings of our usual 60 or so members at the time that um, uh, decide to turn up for the barbecue or not uh, remains to be seen, Christmas barbecue. Uh, it may very well be that we are still on very restricted numbers and um, it has to be uh, some, other, um, some other event uh, instead. So tonight's talk is given by uh, Professor Ulrich uh, Walter, a German uh, astronaut and payload specialist who flew on the Columbia STS-55 uh, mission and uh, has been in line for other uh, missions as well. And he's uh, talking about his experiences uh, of uh, life and uh, love in space. A very interesting topic, and um, if uh, you're interested, at, uh, particularly in the latter parts, uh, hang around for towards the uh, the end of uh, the talk that uh, goes for about uh, three quarters of. Mankind has always looked to the stars. Since time immemorial, the universe has been a source of fascination and fundamental questions. What else is out there? How was all this created? Where do we come from? Mankind has left the Earth. Living in space has become almost routine. But weightlessness is a state that terrestrial bodies are not designed for. Space is a deadly environment for unprotected human beings. And yet, people do live in space. Scientists and researchers, and even tourists, have already floated above the Earth. Welcome to Space Time with Ulrich Walter, astronaut and scientist. He knows, in space, incredible things are in store for us. This is the highest apartment sharing project in the world. 400 kilometers above the Earth's surface, the International Space Station orbits our planet. 
Weightlessness determines the daily routine of the six-man crew. A life with no up and no down. Everything that isn't fixed into place floats around freely. But human beings are designed for gravity. Everyday tasks considered routine on Earth take on an entirely new dimension in weightlessness. Hardly a day goes by without people asking me, Herr Walter, what's it like? How do you eat up there? How do you use the toilet? And how do you sleep in space? These are all topics that interest you as well, I know. But there are also questions like, what if someone gets sick up there and falls seriously ill? Or what do you do if there are conflicts between the astronauts? How do you deal with that? All very interesting subjects. Right up to the question, tell me, is sex possible in space? Life in space is life in permanent extremes, which the human body is not made for. But our curiosity drives us on, and more and more people are spending more and more time away from our planet. Man has set foot on the moon. He has sent probes to the very edge of our solar system and landed robots on Mars. Yet there is one thing today's engineers have not yet been able to put into practice. A shower that works properly in weightlessness. I've heard from an astronaut that uh, the station when you first arrive sometimes smells a bit like an old gym but you quickly get used to it and don't even notice. So, I mean, up there, it's, it's hygienic, but it's, it's different to how we do things on Earth. The main task on the space station is science. Everything else is subordinated to this. Well, you can't take a shower on the space station because there isn't one. But it's not so bad either. It's a bit like being on a campsite or something. I mean, no showers, but there are these wet wipes. You don't exactly feel as clean as you would after a shower. But it's no big deal. Just use the wet wipes and you feel a bit dirtier than you would normally. <laughs> Those living on board the space station are part of the greatest experiment in human history. And yet, their working day is very similar to that of other shift workers on Mother Earth. You get up at 6, 6.30 in the morning, have an hour or so to yourself to get washed and have breakfast before the conference with Mission Control at 7.30. This is what starts the day. Then you actually work your shift through till 7 in the evening, when there's another conference with Mission Control to discuss what needs to be done the following day. You look at a few things, like procedures you'll be carrying out the next day, get the tools ready that you'll need so you don't have to do it in the morning, and then it's time for your evening meal. Shortly after that, you have an hour or so to yourself when you can do your own things. The simplest tasks on Earth become logistical challenges in weightlessness. Let's see. To get started, these are the things I need. A bag of warm water, a little no-rinse shampoo, towel, and my comb. What I like to do is start by just putting some hot water, squirting it onto my scalp. And I have a mirror here so I can kind of watch what I'm doing. Sometimes the water gets away from you and you try and catch as much as you can. Then I just work the water up through to the ends of my hair. And I take my no rinse shampoo and squirt it also on the scalp, just a little bit, and rub it in. Again, kind of working it out to the ends. And sometimes I'll actually take my comb to help work it all the way to the ends. And I like to take my towel while I have the shampoo in there and just kind of work it. Because without standing under running water, you kind of need to use the towel a little bit to help get some of the dirt out. The hairstyle itself determines how much care is actually required. And that's it. Thank you. The space station is a high-technology structure, 
Between life support systems, computers and laboratories, the crew finds its own space. So this is Node 2. This is a really cool module. Um, of course, most of these modules you'll see they have four sides uh, and they're put together. That way we could sort of wa work on a flat plane, either a wall, a floor, another wall, or the ceiling. But, you know, again, all you have to do is turn yourself and your reference changes. The reason I'm bringing that up is because this is where four out of six of us sleep. And so people always ask about sleeping in space. Do you lie down? Are you in a bed? Um, not really, because it doesn't matter. You don't really have the sensation of lying down. You just sit in your sleeping bag. So here's one sleep station right here. I'm going in right now. You can follow me if you want. So I'm inside. It's sort of like a little phone booth, um, but it's pretty comfy. I've got a sleeping bag right here that we sleep in, so we don't have a, sort of like a little bit of a cover. We don't fly all over the place. Um, but you know, you can sleep in any orientation. I have it sleeping, feeling like I'm standing up right now, but like you saw, I'm on the floor, but it doesn't matter if I turn over and I sleep. Upside down. In a way, the sleeping bag is just there to hold you in place and keep you warm. And I really liked it. There are also colleagues who say, I didn't sleep very well there. I need the feeling that there's something underneath my back. And so if you need that, you can span a few of these elastic bands across the sleeping bag to press you up against the wall or ceiling, or wherever you happen to have your sleeping bag. But I must say I really slept wonderfully well in the weightless environment. The sleep station is also like a little office. We've got a computer in here. As you can see, we've got a couple little toys. I've got some books, I've got some clothes, and other things that make it sort of like home. Orbiting the Earth, even very simple tasks are highly complicated. The lack of gravity also creates difficult conditions for the morning bathroom rituals. Well, here is the bathroom, essentially. You get up in the morning, and we have a little kit, and it has all the essential things that you need, like your toothbrush and toothpaste and brush. See how, see how much better the brush makes my hair look? <laughs> I'm just joking. It still stands up straight. It doesn't matter where you are. It's always going to stand up straight while you're up in space. A lot of people ask about toothbrush and toothpaste. So luckily enough, toothpaste, you can do it upside right this way, is sticky and so it sticks to your toothbrush, no problem. Another cool thing is that water sticks to your toothbrush too. If you can see it, I'll have some water come out. The water is pretty neat up in space. It'll stick to your toothbrush and it will make a, whoop, a big bubble. And that's just by surface tension. And then you can drink it. So a lot of people ask about what do you do with the toothpaste after you brush your teeth? Swallow it, and it's sort of like mouthwash, but it tastes a little gross. Or you can just spit it out in a paper towel, and then you don't have to worry about it. What is the daily rhythm like up there on the space station? Well, actually, there are two rhythms, a quite normal 24-hour rhythm, like on Earth, and the time up there is Greenwich Mean Time. That's Central European winter time minus one hour. Then there's another rhythm, the day-night rhythm, determined by the orbit. You're flying around the Earth once every 90 minutes, so it's light for 45 minutes and dark for 45 minutes. It's hard to imagine how strange that is. You look outside in the morning, it's light, 
and you get up. You brush your teeth, have your breakfast, and then it's dark again. So those are two very different rhythms. The day begins at 6 in the morning when you get up. Then you have a little breakfast and go straight to work in one of the space labs. Training astronauts takes several years. And of course, they also learn how to use the space toilet. Here we are at the throne. This is awesome. You might see the little, um, you might have noticed the little moon on the outside. This is our orbital outhouse right here. And of course, it serves for two functions. Number two, right here. I'll show you. But you see it's pretty small, so you have to have pretty good aim and you'll be, be ready to make sure things get let go the right direction. And it smells a little bit, so I'm closing it up. And that's of course for number two. And this guy right here is for number one. So they're sort of two slightly separate functions, but you can do a little, essentially both, by hanging on right here and doing number one and number two. I might add it's color coded so you really don't get it mixed up, which is nice. This is yellows for number one. And also there's a selection of paper. People always ask about toilet paper. What do you do with toilet paper? What kind of toilet paper do you have? We have gloves just because sometimes it does get messy. We have some Russian wipes, which are a little bit coarse if you like the coarse type of toilet paper. We have some nice tissues, which are nice and soft if you like soft toilet paper. We have huggies, um, just for any cleanup. You know, we were all babies once and this sort of helps. And then if things get really out of control, we have uh, disinfectant wipes just to make sure we clean up here. Because you know, just like the water, I showed you the number one stuff can sort of go all over the place if you don't aim correctly. And did I mention both of these have a little bit of suction so they should keep things going in the right direction. But um, like I said, sometimes things get a little out of control if you are out of control yourself flying around. So we have lots of protective stuff. And of course you do have your privacy. There's a little door. The first space station was launched into orbit by the Soviets in 1971. The Russians had lost the race to the moon, but they certainly lay down a marker with the Salyut-1 space laboratory. The first crew consisted of three cosmonauts who spent 32 days in orbit. Tragically, disaster struck on the scientists' return to Earth. A valve inside the Soyuz capsule opened too early and within minutes, all the oxygen had escaped. When they were recovered, the three cosmonauts, Dobrovolsky, Volkov and Patsayev, were already dead. They had suffocated. In 1973, using a converted version of the Saturn V moon rocket, the Americans launched their space station, Skylab. 440 kilometers above the Earth, NASA also wanted to investigate the effects of weightlessness on the human organism. In Skylab, the astronauts conducted countless scientific experiments. And while doing so, they discovered the lightness of being. Jogging in space, they emulated film director Stanley Kubrick, whose science fiction saga 2001 A Space Odyssey had hit the cinemas five years previously. In his masterpiece, Kubrick plays extensively with the themes of weightlessness and artificially generated gravity. Released from their own weight, flying through nothingness in a metal barrel. An extraordinary experience for the Skylab crew. In 1986, the Soviets put their so far largest space laboratory into orbit. The Mir, 
Russian for peace, was mankind's first permanent outpost in space, the first space station designed for long-term operation. And the Mir's success consolidated the Soviet Union's status as a space power. This laboratory orbiting the Earth also became a symbol for the end of the Cold War. And in 1995, the US launched its Atlantis shuttle up to the Red Space Station. Americans and Russians coming together in space. More than 100 cosmonauts and astronauts from the whole world spent time on board Mir. Among them, four Germans. After 15 years of service, the space station was deorbited and brought down into the Pacific Ocean. And then, based on the Mir station, the Russians and Americans together set up a joint space station. That was in 1998, and it's still up there today, the International Space Station. And meanwhile, it weighs over 300 tons. The football field-sized space laboratory is operated as a multi-nation project involving 14 countries. The International Space Station, ISS, is made up of individual modules and over the years has grown steadily to its present size. The station, meanwhile, has 2,200 cubic meters of working and living space. Research is carried out both inside and outside the station, both for the benefit of humans and also for the future of space travel. Scientists want to find out whether man can survive permanently beyond his home planet. A key purpose of the ISS is to prepare for human uh, space exploration to other destinations. And we're really doing that there already. For example, um, we're developing a closed light loop life support system, which is really critical because as we get further from the Earth, we don't want to be sending up consumables all the time. The cultivation of lettuce and vegetables on the ISS was a first important step for future life in space. Oxygen, drinking water, food and fuel for returning to Earth. For a multi-year mission into the depths of space, not all supplies can be taken along. Consequently, systems have to be developed that not only recycle the air we breathe and the water we drink, but which can also supply food and fuel. A mission to Mars is scheduled to take several years, so it just won't be possible to supply the astronauts from the Earth. The big challenge for the Mars mission is that if you really want to fly people there, you have to create systems that are totally autonomous by then. So you actually have to set up a small biosphere there. All over the world, scientists and engineers are conducting the basic research a Mars mission will require. How can the food supply be guaranteed? What will the accommodation on Mars have to be like? And what must it be able to do? There are quite a few home comforts that future space travelers will also have to do without. You wanted to know how we wash our clothes in space. Well, actually, we don't. We don't have a washing machine here, and also it would up, use up a lot of water, and water is very scarce in space. We also recycle our water, and we only use it to drink or to wash. And to play with, or conduct experiments. How liquids behave in weightlessness is an important field of research, elementary for the construction of fuel and life support systems that can operate in space. The water used in the space station's air conditioning and onboard toilet is treated and reused. For drinking, too. Around a third of the water needed is provided by the recycling system. Water is unquestionably a precious commodity on board the space station. Take a bottle of water like this. 
one liter. How expensive would a liter of water be on the space station? Well, that can be calculated quite easily. As the rule of thumb says, every kilo taken to the space station costs approximately 10,000 euros. And since one liter is one kilo, if you were to buy this bottle up there, it would cost 10,000 euros. And that's the reason why water naturally has to be recycled. Up there, you have to conserve all the water you have, not only condensation, but also urine. Urine contains a lot of water. So what happens on the space station? All the urea and other biological substances are removed from the urine, which leaves you with almost pure water again. And the astronauts even have to drink that. And I'm sure you can imagine that the astronauts and cosmonauts resisted this for a very long time, though they have gradually gotten used to it. Well over 200 space travelers have already been on the station, many of them several times. Among them were also seven tourists who paid very handsomely for the privilege. Here's a pretty cool place. This is sort of like in your house where everybody meets in the morning. Uh, after you wash your face, brush your teeth, you want to find something for breakfast. And this is our kitchen. You might notice there's all sorts of foods here. Uh, it's like opening the refrigerator. You got all your different stuff that you want to have. Drinks, meats, eggs, vegetables, cereals. Uh, bread, uh, snacks, and that's a good place. That's where you find all the candy. Uh, side dishes, and then some little power bars just in case. No tables, no chairs, no plates. On the space station, food just floats in the room, and you just float around it. Eating and weightlessness is a surreal experience that is never likely to lose its fascination. This orbiting restaurant may provide breathtaking views, but it is very expensive. Every kilo transported up there requires enormous effort and expense, but it doesn't necessarily make the food taste better. <laughs> Nevertheless, things have changed considerably in extraterrestrial cuisine. There are now over 100 different dishes to choose from. A huge improvement on the cold paste in aluminium tubes from the early days of space travel. This freeze-dried food is quite typical. It's cooked on Earth, then the water is removed, and then it's taken to the space station. This, for instance, is spaghetti bolognese, spaghetti with pieces of meat in it. So, up there, you take a spike. They have them in the kitchen, stick it in the top here, add the required water, and wait a while until the liquid has spread through it. Then you cut across here with some scissors, slide a spoon or a fork under the flap, and you can eat it. That's one of the classical meals. And all the things you can't freeze dry, like steaks or cheese, cheddar cheese, for example, they are then thermostabilized, which means they are heated to ultra high temperatures to remove all bacteria. That's why cheese is so popular. You can spread it on these crackers here. But the commander's not too fond of crackers when you eat them on their own, because then the crumbs fly around and clog up the electronics. That's why you spread the cheese on the crackers and then they don't make crumbs. And of course, the other classical question is, how do you drink in space? I think one thing is clear, you can't just pick up a glass and drink. It doesn't work like that in weightlessness. So you have to do it like this. You take an aluminum sachet with powder inside. In this case, it's grapefruit. Then you stick the steel spike in again, fill the bag with water, and shake it up well until your drink is ready. Then you take one of these plastic straws, push it into the top, open here, and then you can drink. You don't have to drink it all at once. You can close it again and hang it on the wall. All these things here have a Velcro fastener, otherwise they would all be constantly floating around. So, that's all with regard to food. But there are also different eating cultures and habits. 
There are the Americans, for instance, who say, OK, we've got an hour, but let's just grab something quickly, get it down fast, and we can carry on. Oh no, say the French, let's take plenty of time and enjoy our food. And the Japanese are somewhere in between. On the other hand, the Americans say, wait, we've got to brush our teeth right now. As we all know, they clean their teeth three times a day. Ah, come on, say the Japanese, once a day is enough. You can't imagine how seriously people can argue about such things on board a space station. The ISS is supplied regularly from Earth. It used to be done by Russian space freighters and the space shuttle alone is now a billion dollar business for private commercial enterprises. Food, water, fuel and spare parts. Many tons of supplies are flown into space every year. Non-reusable supply capsules are then loaded with waste from the station. On returning to Earth, the waste and the capsules burn up in the atmosphere. Only the space station's energy supply is self-sufficient. Electricity is generated by huge solar panels. Everything else has to be delivered. Private companies also make use of the research opportunities on the space station. And even the astronauts themselves serve as guinea pigs for testing certain physical processes in weightlessness. There are experiments that we perform ourselves on our own bodies to gain a better understanding of certain illnesses, such as osteoporosis, arteriosclerosis and other things, like immune system disorders. We can actually examine and understand these things better in space and then bring what we've learned back to Earth. For instance, space technology can be found in surgical robots of the kind that were developed at the German Aerospace Center and tested on the space station. Research time in space is limited and very costly. The working days are therefore correspondingly long. 12 hours a day? Is that even legal? No, say the Germans, especially the employee representatives. Eight hours, ten hours maximum. You can't imagine how big a problem that was. We had to negotiate with the Works Council representatives about whether we could be allowed to work 12 hours a day for 10 days. It's not just inside the station that work has to be done, but outside as well. 400 kilometers above the Earth, floating in space at a speed of 28,000 kilometers per hour. Extravehicular activity is the astronaut's most complicated task. Strenuous, dangerous, but at the same time, breathtakingly impressive. Living and working on board a space station is something really fantastic. If you then also have the chance to go outside, that's definitely another highlight. The preparations are very extensive, both the training on Earth and on board the space station, when you have to prepare these extravehicular operations. The station had to be reconfigured, the spacesuits had to be serviced and all the equipment that goes with you had to be prepared. So it's a lot of work, but being able to go outside is an absolute highlight. Being outside the station amidst the sheer endlessness of the universe is probably the most intensive experience an astronaut can have. The only thing protecting him from the hostile, deadly emptiness of outer space is his spacesuit. I call this actually a spacecraft. It has all the oxygen for you, it has all the carbon dioxide removal system for you. It also has a heating and cooling system to make sure to regulate our body temperatures while we're outside. It also has a computer. So it tells you on a display here if there's anything that's going wrong with the suit, if we're running out of oxygen, if we have too much carbon dioxide, um, or any type of electrical problem. So it's a pretty awesome little spacecraft and uh, actually got to go out, use my spacecraft, little spacecraft a couple times and it worked like a charm. Uh, lucky that it works very nice. 
you might want to see what the helmet looks like. It's pretty cool too. We don't usually go out like this, so you usually can see when the helmet's open. So you can see what it looks like inside. Somebody's little head would be inside of here. So you can see, you can turn your head all the way around while you're inside of there, but the helmet stays still. So that's uh, determined your, your, how far you could see. And uh, it's usually pretty sunny out there, so we have to wear our sunglasses. And this is our sunglasses right here, which make you look pretty cool. The suit warms or cools the astronaut, depending on his position vis-a-vis -vis the sun. It supplies them with oxygen and shields them from radiation. Without it, working outside the station would be impossible. You know, it's a very big, big machine. So um, sometimes it's routine maintenance. For example, they're replacing filters or, um, say, um, maintaining existing systems. Or maybe, in some cases, something is broken and it's unforeseen. For example, in the past, there's been problems with the ammonia system that they've had to fix on short notice. So this is all to be expected when you have such uh, an exciting, innovative machine on orbit that it needs to be updated and maintained. Every task outside the station is planned meticulously in advance on Earth. In enormous water tanks, every move is rehearsed and tested on a replica of the station. Only underwater can weightlessness be simulated in any way realistically. In space, no one can afford to make mistakes. The psychological health of astronauts plays a vital role in their preparation. The cramped conditions and the extremely demanding work can easily lead to tensions. A Russian cosmonaut who was up there for a month, then three months, and then a whole year once told me, if you're up there for a month, you can put up with almost anyone. If it's three months, you take a closer look at who's up there with you. And if it's a year, things can explode at the tiniest spark. Your colleague always squeezing the toothpaste tube in the middle could be that tiny spark that sets things off. So, you can see conflicts can arise for lots of different reasons. There's said to have been an incident on the Mir station when a cosmonaut screamed to ground control that if he doesn't get out of here right now, I'll throw him out of the window. However, there is another danger that is far more threatening for the space inhabitants. Flying debris which hits the station on a regular basis. Tiny meteorites, but also space junk, poses a threat to the station and those on board. Larger bodies can be detected early and evaded, but the danger is very real. Hollywood gratefully took up this subject and dramatically staged a horror scenario. Though in space travel, accidents and even fatalities have happened, no one has as yet actually died in space. But the risk is ever-present. I'm often asked whether the movie Gravity is actually realistic. And I can only say, well, yes and no. For example, there are these superb shots of the Earth that look extremely realistic. That's exactly what the Earth's surface looks like by day and night. Great shots. On the other hand, there are unrealistic scenes. For example, the space debris. In space, in relation to the shuttle or space station, this space debris typically travels at a speed of around 5 to 7 kilometers per second. That means, when a piece of debris is 5 to 7 kilometers away, it will hit me the very next second. Can you see debris of that size 5 to 7 kilometers away? No, not at all. So you can safely say all the scenes with space debris flying past are completely unrealistic. Another great danger is fire on board. To extinguish a fire, you first have to know how it will behave. The astronauts burn small amounts of heptanol and methane in special canisters on board the station. Various materials are also lit to see how they burn in weightlessness. 
These experiments serve to develop fire extinguishing systems for future spacecraft, because even the smallest fire can seriously threaten the lives of the crew. A lesson NASA tragically learned during its Apollo moon program. The three astronauts, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee, were selected for the first test flight of the Apollo spaceship. During a ground test in January 1967, an electrical malfunction ignited a fire in the capsule. The astronauts could neither open the hatch nor extinguish the fire. They burnt to death in their capsule. Firefighting is part of the training for every mission into space. There are strict emergency plans for spacecraft and the space station. If the astronaut's reaction is wrong or too slow, they could die. You actually spend hundreds of hours in the simulator with one malfunction after another. And you get into a sweat because you have to combine this, combine that, do this, everything at the same time. And then when it comes to the actual launch, most astronauts say the most irritating thing is that the red alarm lamp doesn't come on and then suddenly everything works like a dream again. But emergencies are never far away. In February 1997, a fire broke out on the Mir space station. Wearing breathing apparatus, the crew managed to extinguish the fire in 12 minutes using four extinguishers. The cosmonauts narrowly escaped disaster. Mir was kept in service until well beyond its designated lifespan. But Russian space technology proved to be robust and easy to repair. Such devices can break down sometimes, and on board the Mir we often had to use spanners, multimeters and soldering irons. We actually measured lots of things with a multimeter and discovered, aha, there's the fault, and repaired it with a soldering iron. The crew of every space station has to carry out constant maintenance, and even the ISS has had its alerts and emergencies. If we have any of those problems, we come right here, which we call the central post. It is the main heart uh, of the space station. It was also the first computers that came up here that ran the space station. And so behind this wall right here are these main computers. So we gather here as a group of three or six and then figure out how we're going to either fight the fire, patch the hole, or solve the, uh, the toxic spill. But only in the most extreme emergency is anything done without first coordinating with Earth. Extravehicular operations can't be carried out at all without prior planning from ground control. A spacewalk is a precisely rehearsed and choreographed activity which is guided by the various control centers. The International Space Station is the greatest technological project of all time. Besides the six crew members, thousands of people on the ground are also working on this project, and they direct and monitor the astronauts' experiments and missions. Most of the time, it runs smoothly, but in emergency situations, it can also lead to conflict. Final decision-making power, just like on a ship, lies with the captain, in this case, the commander. However, in practice, it's somewhat different. Let's take a concrete example. An astronaut has appendicitis. So, first of all, of course, the level of urgency needs to be determined. That's usually decided by doctors on the ground based on the symptoms. If an immediate operation is needed, he gets into one of these Soyuz capsules. There are always two Soyuz rescue capsules on the space station so that in an emergency, crew members can be back on the ground within about 45 minutes. Another example, a piece of space debris collides with the station. The reaction must be immediate. The commander must decide, do we man the capsules and evacuate, or can we seal off a section of the station to prevent any loss of air? That's the commander's decision. It must be taken immediately and the appropriate action initiated. 
And then there's that tricky situation when ground control, the commander and crew are of different opinions. What do you do then? This has actually happened. Ground control said, you have to do this. And those on the station said, we know better what we have to do right now. We're up here and we know what the situation is. It came very close to mutiny on the mirror. But in that actual case, the crew prevailed and the decision was taken by the commander. Sport is compulsory for all space station residents. Weightlessness impairs the human body. Muscle mass and bone density decrease. For the return to Earth, training is vital for survival. The lack of gravity also has some influence on the genes responsible for our immune system. The human organism becomes more susceptible to infection. For their own inner balance and recreation, some play musical instruments, and their comrades simply put up with it. They can't leave anyway. Got those space station blues. Don't know what I'm gonna do. Well, I'm a terrible singer, so I don't think it would be a great success. <laughs> ISS Commander Chris Hatfield, on the other hand, shot to fame with a worldwide hit. This is ground control to Major Tom. You've really made the grave. And the papers want to know whose shirts you wear. With his own space-based cover of David Bowie's Major Tom, the Canadian astronaut became a pop star in his own right. Listening to and playing music is one of the very few possible leisure activities on the ISS. It's hard to believe just how boring it is on the space station. But there's nothing better than sitting together after all the hard work, having a meal and singing along to the guitar. Everyone loves doing that. So, what about drugs? No drugs, of course. But what about alcohol? Well, it's strictly forbidden for the Americans. But there are still the Russians, and they do drink. I'll show you how that works. Here we have space station vodka. Not for the ISS, but for the Mir. Double packaging so that nothing leaks out. Over the years, it's evaporated a little, but this was produced by Russians especially for the Mir station. The Americans don't allow it, but there are also Russian sections of the station. And you ought to know that Russian sections are subject to Russian rules. I think you can work the rest out for yourselves. So have they done it or not? Had sex in space? Jane Fonda did, but only in the movie. As Barbarella in the 1968 film of the same name, the Astro Agent didn't only give us the first weightless strip, but transformed into a genuine space sex tourist. Barbarella is a five-star, double-rated Astro Navigatrix Earth Girl, whose specialty is... Love! It was in August 1982. 
Russia's second female cosmonaut, Svetlana Tsariskaya, flew up to Salyut 7. Awaiting her there were two Russian cosmonauts. The team physician, a certain Dr. Gatsenko, still insists today that the entire mission was undertaken with this one particular intention in mind. So, did anything come of it? Well, we know today that in terms of offspring at least, nothing did come of it. So, from that point of view, the mission failed. For future long-term missions, it's of course important to know how things like this work in theory. I mean sex, of course. A German space physician, a certain Herr Muttke, had already thought about this in the 1980s. And after due consideration, he came to the conclusion that you need to hold on to a pole, because as we know, in weightlessness, you just float away. Although he did say there was another possibility, to copy the way dolphins do it. Now, I'm not sure if you know how dolphins actually do it, but they do it in threes. Two actively participate and the third holds them together. That's why those who have actually had sex in space are known as members of the Three Dolphins Club. Two, one, booster ignition and liftoff of Endeavour. In 1992, the space shuttle Endeavour was launched into space with the first married couple on board. U.S. Americans Jan Davis and Mark Lee met during their astronaut training and fell in love. And before their joint mission, they got married in secret. But a lack of opportunity prevented Jan Davis and Mark Lee gaining membership of the Three Dolphins Club. NASA was not amused by the revelation, and so during their mission together, husband and wife were assigned to different shifts. But once humans set off on long-term missions into the depths of space, traveling to Mars or founding colonies on other planets, space agencies and scientists alike will have to deal with the subject of sex and human reproduction in space. A mission to Mars will last for several years. The crew will be mixed and the loneliness extreme. Even NASA regulations will not be able to prevent close interpersonal relationships. The research into reproduction in space is still in its infancy. But the space agencies will certainly not want to bring back more people from their Mars mission than they actually sent. Moreover, there is no knowledge whatsoever on how life conceived and born in weightlessness can or will develop. Man is a creature of gravity, and if we want to continue living our lives this way and not change completely and become cyborgs or octopuses, then we will certainly need artificial gravity for future forays into space, if we want to survive, but also if we want to be able to reproduce. After all, in the right circumstances, we will want to grow as a population in such a multi-generation spaceship. Inhabitable megastructures that create their own gravity. In the Hollywood film Elysium, one such space colony serves as the habitat of an elite, could afford to escape from an Earth sinking into chaos. In the mid-1970s, NASA too considered this idea. Gigantic circular structures that generate artificial gravity through their own rotational speed. Systems of mirrors reflecting the sunlight create the rhythm of day and night. Space travel today, however, is still struggling with much more trivial problems. All astronauts worldwide, whether Russians, European or Americans, are public service employees. And what do they have to do when they go on an official trip, even if it's into space? They have to write an application for travel expenses, in which it says I'm flying into space. And what do you do when you return? you fill in a travel expenses claim. That contains questions like, how far did you travel? Well, I've just traveled 4.2 million miles. Do I get a mileage allowance for that? NASA's reply is, Herr Walter, did we fly you there or did you fly yourself? NASA is of course right. They flew me into space on the shuttle. What about a daily allowance? Herr Walter says NASA, you had free room and board. Why do you need a daily allowance? Right again. 
But NASA continues. You did travel from home in Houston to the Kennedy Space Center and back, so we can give you some traveling expenses. How much was it? Well, one day I got this letter with a check. So how much did I get for my mission? You can see it right here. $34 for my 10-day mission. And believe it or not, that's the best possible souvenir of my mission anyone could imagine. And that's why I still have this check today. Meanwhile, people now spend up to a year in space, on board the space station, in close orbit around the Earth. Man has flown to the moon, landed on it and returned. But in the not-too-distant future, mankind will really leave the Earth and venture hundreds of millions of kilometers deep into the universe for several years. Man will fly to Mars and land on the surface, perhaps even establishing settlements there. Scientists and engineers are already working on this vision. They are laying the foundations today for the life of the future, a life outside our home planet, Earth. Hi everyone, welcome to Sky for the Month for September 2020, uh, the year that will be well and truly remembered by all of us, I'm sure. Now for the September and October 2020 highlights, as you can see the, the list is a little bit shorter than normal, but uh, I was starting to feel like I was giving you information overload. So what I've done is I've cut the list down to a smaller list of uh, reasonably interesting occurrences. There are others for those who'd like to uh, look it up in the Astronomy 2020 Australia book. Uh, we have a new moon on the 17th of the 9th and the moon is at perigee on the 18th of the 9th, basically meaning it's at its closest approach to Earth. So it's going to be as bright as bright. On the 22nd of the 9th, we have the spring equinox. And during the spring equinox, we have 12 hours of daytime, 12 hours of nighttime, and the sun sets due east, correction, due west, and it rises due east. Comet pan stars and hail are still in the skies, but they're starting to fade to around about 9th uh, to 12th magnitude and uh, as such will require fairly substantial telescopes to be able to, to find them. Mercury, smallest planet of the solar system, is at its greatest elongation, which basically means it's as far from the sun uh, laterally as it's going to uh, get and is an evening object. It'd uh, be an ideal time for viewing it. You may uh, get to see it in a fairly dark sky. Unfortunately, full moon occurs on the 2nd and the 10th as well, and if it's up at the same time, it will blot everything out. Well, certainly Mercury anyway. Uh, at 7pm on the 4th of the 10th, Uranus is 3 degrees north of the moon. Uh, it may prove difficult to get uh, being fairly close to the moon, uh, particularly given the moon has just passed its full phase. So uh, once again, a fairly substantial telescope will be required. Last quarter moon occurs on the 10th of October and Mars is at opposition on the 14th of uh, the 10th, which is uh, ideal time for the viewing of Mars. In the September night sky looking to the south, uh, as you can see, uh, there's, there's always something interesting in, uh, in the southern sky. Apparently we have much better viewing than the Northern Hemisphere. I'm not sure that's not because we can't actually see the sky here in the Southern Hemisphere. A few of these objects are in the south, with the South Celestial Pole there in Octans. 
most of the uh, objects around that pole will rotate in a clockwise direction. Basically, the constellations you see to the uh, east will actually move into the sky, whereas those in the west will move out of the sky. So we're not far off saying goodbye to Scorpio, but then that usually means the appearance of Orion uh, as it pops up in the east. So probably a last opportunity for this year to have a look at things like the Trifford and uh, Lagoon Nebula there. And uh, they are on that dotted yellow line, which is the ecliptic plane, which is essentially about where most of the planets uh, travel uh, around. The, uh, you have the wild duck uh, cluster uh, just above those. And uh, if we move down around the South Pole, uh, we have quite a few objects down there. These may be too low to uh, view. Certainly you should be able to see uh, Crux or the Southern Cross and uh, the Jewel Box just above Mimosa there. And uh, across to the Large Magellanic Cloud, where a reasonable telescope, you should be able to acquire the Tarantula Nebula. Uh, a good little object for those who uh, want to do some astrophotography. And above that, if you're looking for a globular cluster with Omega Centauri, uh, Centauri getting very low on the horizon there, you have 47 Tucanae up there between Hydrus and the Tucana, not too far from the uh, star Achenar. Same sky, but looking north, uh, we note there's uh, probably not quite as many objects as there was in the southern one, or looking to the south. However, you still have the Milky Way there, and uh, the numerous objects in the Milky Way. Have the Lagoon Nebula and the Trifid Nebula, as uh, mentioned previously. However, being in the western uh, sky, they, uh, they will be setting fairly soon. Uh, looking over to the eastern sky, there's not really a lot. Uh, however, if you note down the bottom there, just to the right of north, the Andromeda Galaxy uh, is poking its head up above the horizon. Uh, it is possible to view the Andromeda Galaxy, but you would need a, a fairly low, uh, good view towards the north. So now looking at the planets and what they're up to for the, uh, the next month or so, uh, Mercury uh, is at its best evening viewing this month because uh, it is at maximum elongation, which means it's as far from the sun as it can get and a uh, very good chance it'll be viewable in a, a darkened sky. On the 19th, which uh, may be a little late uh, for this presentation, it does form a neat little triangle with the crescent moon and spiker, the Vita star in Virgo. Uh, Venus, still a morning object uh, for the really enthusiastic. It's moved through Gemini into Cancer and then to Leo later this month. Uh, it will be within a few degrees of uh, Regulus, which is the brightest star in Leo, on the 30th uh, of this month. And Earth reaches its spring equinox on the 22nd. Uh, probably about the time you're listening to this uh, presentation. And as the days get longer, we can only hope that uh, we get a little bit more freedom. Mars uh, is rising around 8.30pm uh, from mid-September and uh, is moving in an apparent retrograde motion, which means it appears to move westward against the background of stars. This is just an optical illusion due to our comparative orbits. Uh, it's currently in the constellation of Pisces until the middle of November, and it will brighten from minus 1.8 mag to minus 2.5 mag, which means it's quite bright, and it is in the best position uh, for the next two years for visual astronomy. Uh, Jupiter. Still visible high in the northern sky uh, this month, transiting the meridian at dusk. 
It has been moving retrograde uh, for the last four months, uh, as for Mars, moving westward against its background of stars, but it has now resumed its normal motion or normal apparent motion. Uh, this will bring it fairly close to Saturn in December. And for those who've been looking at Greg Walton's uh, Facebook posts, uh, the moons of Jupiter have been putting on a fairly spectacular display. Uh, Saturn has gone past its opposition last month, uh, so it's fairly high in the northern sky, and it passes the meridian around 8 p.m. Uh, it's also been on an apparent retrograde uh, motion, and it's probably due to the fact that the those three planets just mentioned are all fairly uh, close in the night sky, and as we move past them, they actually appear to move in the wrong direction. As I said, it's just an optical illusion. Uh, it will assume its normal progress against its background stars later this month. Uranus still in Aries, going to be saying that until 2024. Uh, it is now rising in the mid-evening and uh, it can be found very close to the whale's tail. Uh, for those who wish to view it, you'll need a reasonable size telescope and it's not much more than a bluish green disc. Uh, Neptune, even worse, still in Aquarius, uh, has reached opposition on the 12th. Uh, despite this, you'll need a fairly uh, sizable telescope, generally eight inches or more, and uh, you may be able to pick up its largest moon, Triton. The appearance uh, of the planets for the uh, month, as you can see, Mercury is uh, reasonably sized. It uh, will show Crescent uh, in accordance with its current position around the Sun. Venus, uh, you like the shadow is on the other side of Venus. It's because the Sun's lighting it from the other side in comparison to Mercury, because Mercury is in the evening sky and Venus is in the night sky. Mars, uh, it actually appears a little bit gibbous at the moment. Uh, you can still see a slight darkened background, but you'll note it's actually getting bigger uh, as uh, as it moves or as it moves into its opposition. Uh, Saturn, Jupiter, both still very spectacular. Uh, and as uh, mentioned earlier, uh, the moons seem to be putting on a very good shadow display at the moment. Uh, Uranus, and Neptune, not much more than bluish green and blue dots. And Pluto could be any one of that multitude of stars, given it's currently in Sagittarius, uh, in the middle of the Milky Way, with uh, a lot of other dots that could be Pluto. As uh, for other objects currently uh, viewable, uh, Comet 88P Howe has uh, reached perihelion on the 27th at 1.35 astronomical units, uh, currently in Scorpio, but moving into Ophiuchus and Sagittarius, uh, which, as for Pluto, might make it a little difficult to, to, to spot. Uh, it's currently about ninth magnitude. Uh, Comet Panstars is in Virgo uh, for most of the month, sitting around 9 p.m., and it's expected to fade from ninth magnitude to tenth magnitude, so you'll need a fairly substantial scope to to see it. Uh, at the end of the month, moves into Libra, and so it'll be very low on the western horizon. And Comet 2P Enki, it sets in, sitting around 1 a.m. and uh, moves in uh, from Lupus into Scorpio, but at about thirteenth magnitude. Uh, really good luck trying to find that one. For those who like a bit of a challenge uh, and would like to go asteroid hunting, these are the five asteroids that uh, this month are at uh, opposition, uh, therefore the best opportunity to see them and the dates at which they are at opposition and the constellations are in. But as you can see from the magnitude, you'll need a fairly substantial telescope. And probably the best way to find them would be to take a series of photographs over a few nights. Uh, Pluto has just passed opposition uh, and currently transits the meridian around 8 p.m. 
and by transit to Meridian, uh, I mean it passes due north of us. And to conclude tonight's presentation, we'll move on with Steve O's solar system tour. Uh, tonight, looking at the planet that has given rise to more Earth invasions than uh, all the rest put together. You know, of course, refer to the little green men that all come from Mars. Uh, Mars was one of the first planets observed, uh, obviously due to its proximity to Earth. Because of its red colour, it was named for the Roman god of war. Uh, many years, it was considered the most likely planet to uh, either house life or have traces of life, uh, even if it is now extinct. But uh, recent discoveries in the clouds of Venus may uh, change that. Through a telescope, appears as an orange uh, disc with darker patches. And when they were uh, initially looked at, uh, they were relatively straight and they were thought to be man-made or Martian-made canals and were referred to as canali. When you look at it through that telescope, you can see these darker patches and you can also, uh, if they're particularly prominent, you can see their poles, uh, similar to uh, what Earth has, except Martian ones are made of carbon dioxide. Has a diameter of 6,792 kilometres, which means it's uh, roughly the half the size of Earth. And it is accompanied by two moons, Phoebos and Deimos. Now, both these moons are extremely small and uh, very irregular in shape. So uh, most astronomers suspect they may have been asteroids that wandered a little bit too close to the planet. It is uh, 227,780,000 kilometres from the Sun, or in more simple terms, 1.5 astronomical units, essentially meaning it's about half as far from the Sun as what, uh, again, as what Earth is. It has an orbital period of 687 days, so I guess if you, uh, when you get up, some of us older people, we'd quite happily only have a birthday every 687 days really half the age we are now. It's uh, best viewed in opposition, which just happens to occur uh, in October. As uh, such, it will uh, appear to brighten uh, in our sky as it moves towards opposition. The last time I was in opposition, uh, which is 2018, it was also at perihelion, and being closer to the sun, the increased activity of its atmosphere stirred up a lot of dust storms, and as such, it was not uh, not great viewing. Hopefully, this time that won't occur. And for the last time during Steve O's solar system tour, the slide showing the uh, four terrestrial planets uh, next to each other uh, in relative sizes. As you can see, Mars not much bigger than Mercury, about half the size of Earth and Venus. Uh, however, it certainly has a lot of detail on its uh, disk that uh, is worth looking at and dependent upon the size of your telescope as to just how much detail you can see. But even a, a fairly modest scope with good viewing, good dark skies, you can usually pick out the pole. They're quite reflective. And as ever, the information provided in tonight's presentation was provided by Astronomy 2020 by Wallace Dawes and Northfield. It's my understanding that the Astronomy 2021 edition is uh, not far from becoming available. I would urge everyone who uh, is certainly interested in astronomy and the information uh, contained to keep a bit of an eye out and reserve yourself a copy when they become available. Mark Stevens signing off till next month and thank you for listening. An international team of astronomers has made an unexpected discovery. They detected phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus. 
Professor Jane Greaves of Cardiff University is the lead author on the study, published in Nature Astronomy. So we asked her the big question. Is there life on Venus? But first, let's start with the basics. What is phosphine? So I like to think of phosphine as uh, ammonia's evil cousin. So ammonia is a molecule where you've got one nitrogen atom and then you've got three hydrogen atoms hanging off it as if on little legs. So if you took the nitrogen atom out and replaced it with a phosphorus atom, then you'd have phosphine, PH3. So what's so special about phosphine? We know the molecule phosphine is a biomarker on Earth. Biomarkers. Natural products that can be traced to a particular biological origin. It's been suggested that there are possible habitats in the cloud decks of Venus, so somewhere where little life forms could live. Isn't Venus pretty inhospitable? When we talk about habitat, what we mean is much higher up. So the clouds, which are at about 50 kilometres altitude, and that's maybe 10 times higher up than we think of as the top of the atmosphere on the Earth. And in those high clouds, although it is very acidic, it's also reasonably warm, maybe about 20 degrees centigrade. And it also has pressure that's about like the one bar pressure at the surface of the Earth. So that's why we think of it as a possible habitat. How did you make your discovery? What we did was we went out and used radio telescopes to see if we could detect the presence of the molecule phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus. The telescopes we used are the James Clark Maxwell Telescope, the JCMT, which is on a mountain in Hawaii, and the network of telescopes, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, down in Chile. When you're looking at a wavelength of about one millimeter, Venus essentially acts like a giant light bulb in the sky. But if you look at a very specific wavelength, a little bit of that light is missing because the phosphine molecules have absorbed it and so it's not present. And so what we see is essentially some kind of squiggly line with going along with wavelength, nothing there. And then a sort of V-shaped dip, that's the phosphine, and then some more squiggly line. So you can interpret that with the shape of that V-shaped dip to say what molecules are doing the absorbing and a little bit about the um, height in the atmosphere that they occur. Are you sure it's phosphine? When we analysed the data, we found from our spectra from both the JCMT and ALMA that it really seems to definitely be phosphine. It's not another molecule. What did you do next? Next work from that was to say, why is phosphine there? And to do the calculations that say, could it come from natural sources? So could it be a chemical reaction with minerals that blow up from the ground or a reaction to do with sunlight? And we were able to rule all of those out. So what could have created it? On Earth, phosphine can be made in two ways. It's made industrially for some purposes, although you don't really want to be doing that a lot because it's a highly toxic molecule to larger life forms like us, for example. It's also made by microbes, small bacteria, for example, and they're the kind of bacteria that thrive where there's no oxygen, so they've got a completely different way of life to much of what we're used to. Could microorganisms be producing phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus? It's very hard to explain the presence of the molecule phosphine without life, so not in any other natural way. But we also think that life would really struggle to deal with the incredibly acid environment of the clouds of Venus. On Earth, we know of really robust life forms, little bacteria that can exist where there's about 5% of acid dissolved in water, and that's quite an incredible feat. On Venus, the clouds are probably about 90% acid, and that's incredibly corrosive. We don't really have an easy way to do an experiment to see if a life form could survive that. Back to the big question. So is there really life on Venus? I really hope so, but we can't absolutely tell with the results we've got so far. So it may be that the only thing to do is to send a spacecraft that can really sample and see if there are life forms there.
Hey, I'm Diana, and you are probably on planet Earth watching Physics Girl. I too was on planet Earth the other day when I recently dropped by UCLA to visit a really cool friend of mine. Raquel Nuno is a planetary geologist, and I brought her probably the most boring question you could bring to such a scientist. Can I live on planet Mars? Pretend this is Mars. Not sounding good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to live there either. <laughs> Planetary geologists are creative and sneaky in finding out a lot of things, including the hospitability of Mars. If you want to know whether Mars is going to kill you and which of its hostile traits is going to kill you first, you have to get creative. Let's look at all the ways that Mars is a complete death trap and how we know. Seems like a useless atmosphere is a good place to start. So one of the biggest differences is the atmosphere of Mars. So it's about 1% uh, as thick as, as here on Earth. So it's there's not much going on there. And because there's not much atmosphere, it's, it's hard to keep heat in. That's actually one of the reasons why Mars is so cold. Mars is missing a decent gas blanket. It's like trying to camp on a glacier with nothing but a bed sheet. It gets really cold. The average surface temperature on Mars is minus 63 degrees Celsius. <sighs> Plus, with an atmosphere that's 1% the thickness of Earth's atmosphere and 95% carbon dioxide, you would run out of oxygen pretty quickly. I think that that's very crucial for humans to, to live in an environment right. like you need to breathe. <laughs> It'd be like trying to breathe at over 100,000 feet of elevation here on Earth. We need an oxygen mask to assist with breathing when we get up to only 15,000 feet. So for my Mars work, what I'm trying to understand is how the thickness of the atmosphere has changed over time. She ended up blowing my mind with this fact, with this phenomenon that only happens on the planet Mars, of all the planets in our solar system. Mars has this funny little thing where it tilts. It goes through cycles where it slowly goes and tilts and then it comes back up. And so its orbit, sometimes it's spinning straight up and sometimes it's spinning sideways. Mars is currently tilted at about 25 degrees, which is two degrees more than Earth. But we have evidence that it has tilted from between zero and 60 degrees. And it's a chaotic cycle. It kind of randomly tilts. I wanted to know why it tilts. And so of course I asked Raquel, and we'll get to that answer in a minute, but first, what are the implications of this tilting? It is a really dynamic place. You have the poles um, and you have ice sublimating, so that's going from solid to gas, depending on how hot it is. And then when it's more straight up, it's the thing, it's cold, so it kind of, the atmosphere essentially collapses and, and it forms back on the poles and the water goes into the soil. So not only does Mars tilt, the thickness of its atmosphere changes over time as more of its poles are exposed to the sun's light. Whoa. Now the atmosphere only changes by about a factor of 10, and we're still trying to figure out exactly how much it changes, but this is my burning question, always. This is always the question I wanna know. How do we know? How do scientists know that the atmosphere has become thinner and thicker over time. You can't just send a scientist down to the surface of Mars and ask her to wave her hand around and then ask her, how thick is the atmosphere, Marge? No, and forget easily trying to figure out how thick the atmosphere was in the past. But planetary geologists are sneaky. This is how Raquel goes about detectiving out how thick the atmosphere was on another planet millions of years ago. I look at small, super tiny impact craters. So if you have a very thick atmosphere, a small rock isn't gonna make it through the atmosphere, it's just gonna burn up. But if you have a very thin atmosphere, it doesn't care, it's just gonna punch right through and create a tiny little crater at the surface. What size crater can we make at the surface depending on how thick the atmosphere is? And then looking at the evidence that we find at the surface. So Mars tilts because, so a couple of reasons. One of the reasons that it's, it's got Jupiter so sometimes it, pull, it's, it pulls on it on Mars. And the other big thing, it doesn't have a moon like we have to stabilize its orbit. So it can, it can wobble because there's no moon to keep it just straight up. Like we, you know, we're not straight up, we're like 23 degrees offset. But yeah, we, we don't wobble as much as Mars does because we have this wonderful moon. See, another reason to love the moon. <laughs> Now with a thin atmosphere, most people think of the cold and they think of the lack of oxygen, but there's also no pressure. Mars's atmosphere is six millibar as compared to Earth's 1,013 millibar. So it'd kind of just feel like being out in the vacuum of space. Not fun. How do we know about Mars's atmosphere? 
We've seen evidence for the thickness of Mars's atmosphere by looking at unusual things, like projectile rocks that have shot out of volcano eruptions, and we've observed how far away they landed. This can tell us how much air resistance the rocks experienced when they were flying through the air, which is correlated with how thick the atmosphere was. So we were able to learn a lot of things like this before we even landed on Mars's surface by doing flybys, like the 1965 Mariner 4 flyby. Now we can learn a lot about Mars's atmosphere from probes that we've actually landed on the surface, and some that we've crashed. Oops. Besides a good atmosphere, there are other missing protections on Mars too. On Earth, we've got this weird invisible thing that goes bzz, 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 <laughs> to charged particles and other harmful cosmic rays that hit Earth. It is Earth's magnetic field. It does really wonderful things for us, and Mars doesn't have one. Shucks. And then another thing that I think is really big that people don't think about, the, the sun is always blowing out massive amounts of charged particles in through, just out through the solar system. And we're really lucky that we have a, a magnetic field that sort of deflects most of those particles. Some still do make it to us, uh, but Mars doesn't have that. So all of that ionizing radiation uh, comes in and hits the surface, essentially sterilizing it. That's very dangerous for, for life. Mm-hmm. How do we know about Mars's magnetic field? Well, now we can measure it, but before that, there were actual rocks from Mars that landed on Earth with evidence of magnetic metals that were once aligned by a magnetic field and then frozen in place when they cooled. So you see that evidence for an ancient magnetic field. So we think that at some point, maybe early in its history, where it still had a liquid core, a much bigger liquid core, that it did have a magnetic field, but it cooled down, we were, we're not sure why or how, but it could have just been over time the, the planet cooled down and they essentially turned off that, that, the magnetic field of Mars. So Mars is smaller than the Earth, so it's cooled down a lot faster. And we think that you need a liquid, some sort of liquid component metal inside the core to be able to generate dynamos, which are, is what we call like magnetic fields. And then there's this. The biggest volcano in the solar system is on Mars, so, which is amazing to think about. So one of the things that, that makes the volcanoes on Mars different is because there's no plate tectonics. Here on Earth, when the crust moves, as the crust moves, the hot spots create a new volcano. Uh, on Mars, that doesn't happen, so they get to be really big because of that. Stuff comes out of the same place over and over, over millions of years, and that's how they get so big. Okay, so for habitability, we're not sure if the volcanoes are still active or not. There could still be some sort of volcanic activity okay. going on that could potentially erupt in the next few million years on, on Mars. So if we have a, a base somewhere on right. Mars, you want to make sure that you're not near a volcano probably, yeah. because we just don't know. There's a lot of things that we still need to learn before I think we, we can determine whether or not a volcano could affect human uh, settlement on Mars. Interesting, right? So then a final challenge in trying to live on Mars is finding an energy source. Take solar. Sometimes we look through telescopes at Mars and we see that the entire planet is fuzzy. Turns out there are planet-wide dust storms. So they can be massive. They can actually um, incorporate the whole planet, what we call a global dust storm. It's pretty nuts. Sometimes you look at images from these spacecraft that are orbiting Mars and the whole thing is just blurry because the whole planet is covered in these dust storms. You know, like in The Martian, that was yeah. the whole premise of the movie was this massive dust storm um, caused all sorts of problems, but in reality, it wouldn't. And even though the wind speeds are really high, the, there's not just not enough stuff to, to go around and actually cause any damage. It'd be just like a gentle like breeze <laughs> in your face. You're like, oh, this is nice. <laughs> and you know what dust isn't good for? Solar panels, trying to get sunlight. And there's only about 40% of the amount of sunlight reaching Mars as here on Earth. Then there's geothermal energy. There's hardly any geological activity on Mars because Mars is such a cold planet. Wind is weaker for wind turbines because there's no air, bro. And forget fossil fuels because we haven't discovered any evidence for any types of life on Mars. Not even frogs. So while there's still hope for crazy life forms that can survive in harsh environments like Mars, it's still a long shot for humans until Mars rolls over and gets that thick atmosphere and warms the heck up. Until then, enjoy your internet videos here on Earth and
Oh, look, she's smiling. She must be so happy to be with me. Oh, he's not coming over. I bet he's mad at me for being gone all day. Stop! I can't do it anymore. Even if I'm just pretending, I can't anthropomorphize. You've probably heard the word anthropomorphize before. It means attributing human emotions to non-human animals or objects. It's a super easy thing to slip into because we're using a human brain ensconced in human culture to observe and interpret a non-human's actions. So it takes practice and a clear understanding of why it's important not to anthropomorphize. is not smiling at me. If I only looked at the shape of her mouth, then I might be missing out on all the other ways she's trying to communicate with me. Maybe she's stressed out or aggressive. I wouldn't know if I only looked at her mouth. Just because humans smile to indicate happiness doesn't mean that other animals do too. In fact, smiling can be a nonverbal communication for aggression in some animals. Some primates use an open teeth smile as a way to say, look at my teeth, they're sharp and I will use them if I need to or a closed teeth smile to indicate submission. And Tina the rubber boa is smiling for no other reason than her mouth is shaped that way. It's important not to use anthropomorphism to interpret an animal's behavior because you're going to miss out on what that animal is really trying to communicate to you. Learning how an animal communicates is one of my favorite parts of caring for them. I'd like to share a couple stories where anthropomorphizing the animal could have led to problems between the human and the animal. Chili Pepper the Patagonian cavy is sitting in the corner when I walk in. Instead of walking up to greet me like a human might, he stays still, keeping his distance. If I interpreted that behavior as him being mad at me, then I might try and avoid him or give him treats to make him happy again. But if I know what a cabbie's natural behaviors are, I know that he's just instinctually taking in the situation before he acts. If I wait just one more second, He'll determine that the situation is safe and he actually does want to come over and interact with me. If I had left him alone thinking he was mad at me, I would have missed out on a good interaction session. Here's another story. We used to have an umbrella cockatoo named Coconut and he used to say hello every time he saw my dad. Now, my dad being the normal human that he is, thought Coconut was being friendly. When I finally saw the behavior for myself, I immediately knew Coconut was being anything but friendly. His crest was up, his eyes were pitting, his wings were held away from his body, and his beak was held open. This is the most aggressive stance that a cockatoo can hold, and Coconut was communicating in no subtle terms that he intensely disliked my dad. Now, it wasn't my dad's fault. Coconut just didn't like men, but I'm really glad that my dad never tried to interact with him because, well, Umbrella cockatoos can break a broomstick with their beak. When I know how an animal communicates in their own language, it makes it so much easier to care for their mental and physical well-being. Now, it's impossible to completely get rid of anthropomorphism since I am using a human brain. However, when my intentions are to understand an animal's behavior from the animal's point of view, then I'm better able to assess their true communications, which just leads to a closer friendship and stronger trust bond between us. Thanks for joining us today on our anthropomorphism adventure. If you would like to go on more adventures with us every week, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, Animal Wonders Montana. If you have any questions, you can leave them in the comments below or find me on Twitter at animal underscore wonders. Thanks guys. My dearest Dolly, because I am riding in my bed, this won't be so terribly neat. But never mind, I'll just go on scrawling, for Dolly is interested in it all the same. Hello and welcome back to another video. If you thought me going through Einstein's grades was an invasion of his privacy, well, the worst was yet to come. Today, as was highly requested, I'm going to be going through Einstein's love letters. Now, the originals are all referenced in the description. These ones I printed out myself onto some tea-stained paper. And well, they're pretty spicy. They show that Einstein struggled with some of the same problems in relationships and love that many people do. And they also show that at times Einstein's mind was lost in space, thinking about physics, but at other times his mind was lost in love. So let's have a look at them. 
Einstein met his first wife, Maleva, while they were both students at university. But that is not where this story starts. No, we are starting with Einstein's high school romance, a girl called Marie Vintola. Beloved sweetheart, many, many thanks, sweetheart, for your charming little letter, which made me endlessly happy. It is so wonderful to be able to press to one's heart such a bit of paper which two so dear little eyes have lovingly beheld. Only now do I realise how indispensable my dear little sunshine has become to my happiness. My mother has also taken you to her heart, even though she does not know you. We can see that Einstein's mother did approve of this little relationship because she signed the bottom of this letter herself. Without having read the letter, I send you cordial greetings from Pauline Einstein. This approval becomes relevant later on when things turn a little sour and the families no longer like each other that much. This girl, Marie, is someone who Einstein met while he was studying at the Aarau School in Switzerland. Einstein actually lodged with Marie's family as her father was a professor at the school. And this letter was written while Einstein was back in his own hometown for the holidays. Here's a reply from Marie. A loved sweetheart, your little basket arrived today and in vain did I strain my eyes looking for a little note even though the mere sight of your dear handwriting in the address was enough to make me happy. It finishes off with, all I can say is that I love you for all eternity, sweetheart, and may God preserve and protect you. A spoiler, eternity didn't last for quite as long as they thought. Fast forward about a year and we have a letter written from Einstein to Pauline Lintela and that is Marie's mother. It's addressed Dear Mommy, which is a little confusing since Einstein's mother's name is also Pauline, but this is him writing to his girlfriend's mother. And it's not the nicest of letters. In fact, it's almost a bit of a breakup note. I am writing you so soon in order to cut short an inner struggle whose outcome is, in fact, already firmly settled in my mind. I cannot come to visit you at Whitsuntide. This must have been some invitation for Einstein to join the family somewhere. He speaks about pain which he has brought her child, pain that was brought through his thoughtlessness and ignorance of her delicate nature. So this sounds like they've freshly broken up and Einstein is cutting ties with the family. There's an interesting sentence here as he goes on to describe what he's up to and he says that strenuous intellectual work and looking at God's nature are the reconciling, fortifying, yet relentlessly strict angels that shall lead me through all of life's troubles. This letter was May 1897, and by February 1898, we have the first letter that I'll show here addressed to Maleva Maric. Maleva was a classmate of Einstein's at ETH. She was the only female there studying physics. And at the time of this letter, she was actually away from Zurich and she was in Heidelberg pursuing some of her studies there. Einstein says that he is very happy about her intention to continue her studies here again. And he's referring to ETH. He also goes on to tell her about some of the material they've covered. And he mentions the infamous Weber, who lectured on heat. Now, if you've seen my video on Einstein's grades, you will know that Weber is a little notorious. They didn't end their relationship on good terms. It's now 1899. We have another letter here to Maleva. This is one that highlights the fact that they used to study together a lot. He says, when I was reading Helmholtz for the first time, it seemed inconceivable that you were not here with me, and now it's not much better. So it seems that Einstein really does enjoy her company. On the other hand, he makes a note here about his family, who he kind of finds a bit narrow-minded. He's struggling to relate with them anymore. It is strange how a way of life will eventually change us and all the nuances of our soul. 
deep inside we become so incomprehensible to each other that we are unable to actively empathize with the other and feel what moves the other. Albert finds in Maleva something that he can't find in his family, which is sort of an intellectual equal, someone who he can discuss Helmholtz with. Perhaps that is why Albert is so attracted to her. She is a couple of years older than him and probably quite mature, probably a lot more so than Albert found in his first relationship with Marie. Here's another letter from Maleva. She says, all this time I have not gotten further than our garden. We now don't go to town at all. There have been many cases of scarlet fever and diphtheria, so that we prefer staying in our own fresh and healthy air. So it shows that lockdown vibes are nothing new. At the bottom of this letter, you can see some of the nicknames that these two used referring to each other. This one is signed off your doxer which is the name for Dolly. Here's another letter from Einstein, and in it he tells Maleva that her letters always make him so happy that everybody teases him for it. He also goes on to mention that his sister is following in his footsteps by moving to Aarau to complete her high school education. He takes it upon himself to mention the little daughter there who he fell so terribly in love with four years ago. And here he's referring to Marie. I'm not quite sure why he says this, but he then says, If I saw the girl again a few times, I would surely get crazy again. I am aware of that and fear it like fire. Maybe something got lost in translation, but it seems like Einstein is telling his current love interest that he's at risk of falling back in love with his ex. Here's a short and sweet note from Maleva addressed to one of her pet names for Albert, Johansel. And she says, since I like you so much and you are so far away that I cannot give you a kiss, I am now writing this little letter and am asking you whether you like me as much as I do you. Answer me immediately. Thousand kisses from your Doc Searle. Albert and Maleva's marriage did end in divorce, but these letters show us that in the in-between years and at the start of their relationship, there was very much a lot of affection between the two. We then have the poem to Maleva, which was written in bed and under it some more disapproval from Einstein's mum. I go into mama's room. First I have to tell her about the examination, then she asks me innocently, so what will become of Dolly? My wife, say I, equally innocently, but prepared for a real scene. This then ensued immediately. Mama threw herself on the bed, buried her head in the pillow and cried like a child. After she had recovered from the initial shock, she immediately switched to a desperate offensive. You are ruining your future and blocking your path through life. That woman cannot gain entrance to a decent family. It seemed that Einstein's mum disapproved of this relationship because she thought that Einstein was too young to marry and settle down. He was about 21 at the time. She thought he was throwing away his career prospects. She also didn't consider Maleva to be very beautiful. At this time where a woman could be either beautiful or smart, Einstein's mum makes remarks about Maleva being a smart one. But as we know, Albert was a very independent person and three years after this letter, Albert and Maleva did go on to get married and they had some children together. He also mentions how he feels restless without Maleva in his presence. He says, When I do not have you, I feel as if I were not whole. When I am sitting, I would like to walk. When I am walking, I look forward to being at home. When I amuse myself, I would like to study. And when I am studying, I feel a lack of contemplativeness and repose. When I go to bed, I am not satisfied with how I pass the day. I like this passage here because it really shows the human aspect of Einstein and the fact that, yes, his mind was on all things physics and thinking of some of 
the biggest ideas there are, but his mind was also in love and he's feeling lovesick and he can't focus. And that's, you know, a side of Einstein that you never hear about. Now, if you remember back to the first letter, we had Einstein's mum, Pauline, giving a glowing review to his first girlfriend, Marie Vintela. Although that is long in the past now, and in fact, this is a very nasty note written from Pauline Einstein to Pauline Vintela. When talking about Marie, she says that we don't want anything to do with her. There is constant friction with Albert because of it. Now, these families are still linked together because I believe Einstein's younger sister, Maya, went to Arau and also boarded with the family. In fact, Maya goes on to marry Marie's brother, Paul, and becomes Maya Vintela. Although in this letter, Einstein's mum says that we should not talk anywhere about an engagement. This Miss Marie is causing me the bitterest hours of my life. If it were in my power, I would make every possible effort to banish her from our horizon. I really dislike her. But I have lost every influence on Albert. You can imagine, dear Frau Professor, how unhappy this makes me. Pauline Einstein. Not sure totally what is going on here, whether Albert is still seeing Marie in some way, but definitely these families are no longer on good terms, although they are forever linked thanks to Maya and Paul. While we're on the topic of hate, let's fast forward a few years to 1912. This is after Einstein's miracle year of productivity, which was in 1905. And here we have a letter to Elsa Lothenthal, who is actually Einstein's cousin. Now, yes, Einstein does go on to marry Elsa. She becomes his second wife after he divorces Maleva. But him and Maleva are still together when this letter was written. They didn't divorce until 1919. Einstein says to Elsa that I can't even begin to tell you how fond I have become of you during these days. He also mentions that he had some kind of fleeting crush on Elsa's sister Paula, but he assures her that is over now. He says, when I think of the bad relationship between my wife and Maya, his sister, or my mother, then I must admit to myself sadly that I find all three of them quite unlikable. But I have to have someone to love, otherwise life is miserable. And this someone is you. You cannot do anything about it, since I'm not asking you for permission. I am the absolute ruler in the netherworld of my imagination, or at least that is what I choose to think. Now, I don't find that sentence too romantic, but it must have worked out for him. Kisses from your Albert. This letter ends with a spicy P.S., which is him saying, if this is what you want, then write me again. I will always destroy the letters as you have requested. I have already destroyed the first one. So I think they knew that this relationship of theirs was not going to be well received and that they were in their best interest to keep it secret. Dearest Elsie, I am writing so late because I have misgivings about our affair. I have the feeling that it will not be good for the two of us, as well as for the others, if we form a closer attachment. So, I am writing to you today for the last time. This breakup letter of sorts with Elsie, while he's still married to Maleva, shows how heartbroken Einstein is to be cutting off this relationship. But never fear, next year in 1913, things are back on. Einstein says, now we will be together and will rejoice in each other. Unfortunately, this won't happen until the end of the winter semester, because I could not bring myself to break off things here so rapidly. Give my regards to uncle and aunt. Here he must be referring to his uncle and aunt, which is Elsa's parents. Certainly a taboo relationship now, and I'm not sure to what extent it was then. This next letter from 1914 showed some of the friction that the relationship faced. Dear Elsa, 
didn't I tell you that all hell would break loose? He refers to Maleva as Misa and says that she is by nature unfriendly and mistrustful. He says you showed her kindness, but she obviously distrusts you. Now that doesn't seem surprising to me, seeing as this Elsa character is about to steal her husband away. This next letter I really wanted to show you. It's written a month later to Elsa, and Einstein is apologizing for being a poor letter writer. He says, I cannot find the time to write because I am occupied with truly great things. Day and night, I rack my brain in an effort to penetrate more deeply into the things that I gradually discovered in the past two years and that represent an unprecedented advance in the fundamental problem of physics. I think this is a nice insight into Einstein's opinions of his own work. He says that he must now write a long article since his most distinguished colleagues refused to accept his point of view. Einstein did have to put in a lot of effort to convince other physicists of his work. And I think this is a fitting final letter to show. It again reminds us that Einstein's life is interwoven with love, life and physics. You can't really separate his correspondence with any of these girls and his obsession with working on figuring out some of these fundamental ideas. At his most excited times, he is talking to these girls about his findings or discussing his studies. I hope you have enjoyed this little insight into an aspect of Einstein's life that you don't often see. I remember when I was a kid waiting an hour for my favorite TV show to come on, which was Sharon, Lois, and Bram, that felt like eternity. But as I've gotten older, everything seems to have sped up. Time is going much faster. That's something virtually everyone agrees upon. Yeah, I feel like, I feel like it does. Oh man, so much. Each year sort of gets faster and faster. But why is this? Is it just an illusion or are there good scientific reasons why time appears to go faster as we get older? Well, I'm working with the National Geographic Channel's Brain Games, a show that explores the inner workings of the human mind through experiments and interactive games to test out some theories about why this actually occurs. There is a reasonable sounding argument that says each year goes faster because it makes up a smaller fraction of your entire life. Let's say I was only 20. One year is only 1 20th of my age. When I'm 67, one year is 1 67th of my age. This graph shows one year as a percentage of your life at each age. But what I find weird about this is if you add up the area underneath the curve, you'll find that you've already lived half of the total by age 6. So I really don't think this is how our brains perceive time. You really think that a, like a day now Of course is... not. <laughs> I think there are better reasons why time appears to speed up as we get older. So I've come to Venice Beach to find two groups of people, the older and younger, to see if their perceptions of time differ. So what I want to do is I want to set my timer going, and without counting, okay. you tell me when you think a minute is up. Let's go. Start. Okay. Everywhere around the world, when this experiment is performed, Older people typically overestimate, while younger people measure it quite accurately. All right, probably stop. Yep. Whoa. One minute, two seconds. A minute and two seconds. A minute and five. As we get older, the rate at which our neurons fire, or our neuron conduction velocity, it decreases. And you can think of this firing rate a little bit like an internal clock. And so if our internal clock is slowing down, that would make everything else, external time, seem to be speeding up. I'm gonna tell you the time. Now? Now. One minute. That's it? That was one minute? One minute. A minute, 17 seconds. Not bad, right? Not bad. I thought I'd be a lot closer, actually, but I <laughs> guess I wasn't. Do you wanna know what it really was? One minute, 47. No way, it was almost two minutes. It was almost, actually, almost, almost two minutes. It, was almost it really minutes. is amazing how fast time flies by, it really is. Our sense of time, or chronoception, is not like one of the standard five senses. It has no specialized receptor cells, and it does not appear to be localized in just one part of the brain. Perhaps this suggests that it's not one coherent thing at all. 
But it does seem that our perception of time is very fundamental. Studies of rats have shown that even with their neocortex removed, that is the higher order thinking part of their brains, they are still able to learn how to time 40 seconds accurately. That's quite remarkable and it suggests our sense of time evolved early and is one of the fundamental functions of the brain. But that doesn't mean our brains always represent time faithfully. For example, have you noticed that really good movies seem to go by much faster than they actually are? Or do you notice that your vacations fly by? There are good reasons for this. When we're focused on something, we don't notice the time is passing and that makes them feel in the moment shorter than they actually are. At its best, this results in a mental state called flow. This can happen when playing sports or video games or artists when they're fully engrossed in their work or people meditating. So I would argue another reason time speeds up as we age is because we are more often engrossed in what we're doing. Another thing that appears to make time speed up is repetition. I'm going to show you a series of images and I want you to consider how long each one appears on the screen. Are you ready? Go. So which one appeared to last the longest? If you're like most people, you'd probably say the dog. But all of those images actually appeared on screen for the same length of time. The dog seemed longer because it was novel and therefore your brain had to invest more energy in processing it. What's remarkable is that our sense of how long something is, or subjective duration, it correlates highly with how much energy we're using in our brains. Now, if you study how much energy people use in their brains over the course of their lifetime, you find that it peaks around age five. If you think about it, this kind of makes sense because when you're a kid, almost everything is novel to you and therefore your brain needs to use more energy. Fully 66% of your resting energy intake, that's used by the brain because of all of the novel experiences. And that must at least in part explain why time appears to go more slowly. So what can we do to slow time down? Well, studies have shown that being afraid increases our perception of time. When arachnophobes were forced to stare at spiders for 45 seconds, yes, this is a real experiment, those arachnophobes judged that experience as lasting much longer than 45 seconds, as you'd kind of expect. Plus, experiments involving skydivers or people falling show that they judge their experience to last much longer than it actually is. Another time when time appears to pass slowly is when you're bored. You know, when you're waiting and waiting, you just, that's all you think about, so it seems like dra time drags forever. Since there is so little to focus on, you are acutely aware of just how much time is passing, and so these boring moments drag on and on. So if you really want to slow down your experience of time, you could scare yourself, take up extreme sports, get into accidents, and intersperse all of that with periods of boredom. But this viewpoint ignores one important fact, which is that we don't experience time as just one thing. We think about time as it passes, but also as it has passed before, when we remember it. And those two ways of looking at time, they don't align. So for example, holidays, they feel like they go by really fast, but when you think back upon them, they last a long time. That's because you had a lot of novel experiences and your brain formed a lot of memories. And it judges the duration of that vacation by the number of memories that were formed. All that novelty means lots of memories, means it feels like it took a long time. But in the moment, it felt fast. This is the paradox, the great paradox of our perception of time. If you want time to go slowly, there are a lot of things you can expose yourself to that will slow time down, but they won't necessarily be pleasant. So maybe the happiest life and the longest remembered life is one where time really seems to fly. It's like Einstein said, put your hand on a stove for a minute and it'll feel like an hour, but sit next to a pretty girl for an hour and it'll feel like a minute. So what would you like your life to feel like? Do <laughs> 
Above the Serengeti I seek to cure what's deep inside Frightened of this thing that I've become Da 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 da